working on as assistant professor of cardiology in Chidong Medical College. He's a very good academic person and a very good interventional cardiologist. And he has got interest in other aspects also, like ECG and echocardiography. Uh, may I request Abdul Wadud Choudhury sir to say a few words about today's presentation and other uh, our speaker. Actually, uh, good evening, everybody. Nassalamu Today, we are going to have again fun session with ECG based on clinical scenarios. What we find and face, difficult situations, sometimes interesting situations, uh, patient presenting with it, ECG, and maybe the actual cause, maybe somewhat something else. I'm not sure what uh, Anisola will be presenting, but I do, I am very much sure that we'll be enjoying it very much. Anis is always very academic and always participating in all the academic forums with a smile in his face. I really like that. And welcome Anis. And I, I'm looking, for, looking forward to enjoy your session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have got also Dr. Kanis Fatima, as a professor of uh, critical care medicine, Bob Bardem, with us. May I request Dr. Anisul Awal to share his screen and go for his presentation. Dr. Anis, please. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good evening. It's my great pleasure to be part of this uh, great forum created by my two very favorite teachers, Atha Ali sir and Wadu sir. They are doing actually it's a brilliant job, I should say, during this starting from the corona pandemic, disseminating knowledge and creating enormous interest among the young fellows about the ECG and make it a very interesting learning forum. And it is always supported by uh, our all respected uh, Professor Rofik sir. Uh, he's an amazing personality. I met him in Chittagong when he uh, tried to give us uh, his own uh, EP uh, machine in, in Chittagong Medical College, but due to technical bureaucracy, we couldn't get it. But he, he had keen interest to set up a EP lab in Chittagong. So I salute him, his endeavor, and he's given his quality, precious time, all time. I, and it is also uh, fortified by professor, another professor, Professor Hafiz. He's another very brilliant, and uh, we also met him in uh, several times in different occasions. So uh, today I'm going to present some of the uh, cases which we face day-to-day -day practice and uh, how we uh, face these cases. And there are many learning issues. We'll hard, uh, hear from many things from our expert panelists. My first case, this is a story of a 70 years old male. He's a non-diabetic hypertensive patient, diagnosed case of Parkinson disease, admitted with the history of chest pain for 10 hours, associated with vomiting, sweating, and restlessness. And uh, on admission, his pulse uh, 104, uh, blood pressure on 40 AG was clear, uh, stable hemodynamically. CBG was normal, troponin was 25. And uh, the baseline is less than 0.3. And ECG shows uh, ST elevation from V1 to V6. And uh, there are some, uh, uh, some ectopic also, and followed by pauses there. So uh, we offer him uh, for initially for uh, intervention, but he declined. Then we start the thrombolytics. And after the thrombolytics, ECG didn't change. So, uh, and also not the uh, clinical feature also not change. His pain persisting and he uh, actually goes down. His blood pressure uh, drops down. We need to inotrop support and he develop actually failure. And uh, we are trying to conservatively manage him. And again, we offered him that, that the, your condition is going down. Can you go for cat? But he declined. So we are treating him conservatively. And his echo, uh, there was almost an abnormality, ejection fraction 45%. And patient on the next day and develop atrial fibrillation. And uh, he's in, already in failure and his failure aggravates. The rate though is showing here is 109, but it was in the monitor is more like more than 150, 160 like that. So we immediately try to get uh, put down the rate so that his failure do not aggravate. We started to using injection amiodarone. After giving injection amio, 
his artwork goes down and actually it goes more down. Then we had to stop the uh, maintenance dose. And uh, when we stopped the maintenance dose, he again developed atrial fibrillation. So in a, we are in a difficult situation. Patient is in a, a failure. He post a mine and did not respond to the thrombolytics and uh, he developed recurrent atrial fibrillation. So we again started amidaron, we settled the patient. And we also again asked him for, can you do go something? But uh, his family said, no, we, we, we don't want to do anything. So there is actually not able to do anything, but conservatively, fortunately, he was able to discharge him hemodynamically stable and in a sinus rhythm. So uh, now the, our, our challenges uh, was some, uh, we, whether this patient needs anticoagulation. If at all need, then which anticoagulation? And patient is, as patient developed with the acute uh, myocardial infarction, he's already on dual antiplatelet. So uh, now he's in a question of the triple therapy. And if you give the triple therapy for how long? And a uh, strategy for taking this patient to cath, what will be the criteria? How we can uh, take, select this patient for the cath? Uh, and uh, what's the ideal time? That's our, our challenges. Uh, Atharsar, yes. can you discuss the case now? Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Arit, so let us discuss the ECG first. Okay, sir. As a, can you show the first ECG? That is the ECG number one. Yes, sir. Anis, sir. looking at this ECG, oh, what are the information we can get from this ECG? Sir. The first ECG. Patient, uh, uh, patient was in sinus rhythm and his uh, left axis deviation. And there is a ST elevation from V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5. And there is also RBB morphology in V1. And there are some uh, ectopics, and which is followed by, uh, there is some pause. So, uh, so for this, I can uh, recognize from this. The first thing is that the patient has ST elevated MI anterior. Yes, sir. Uh, the second is, he has uh, right bundle branch block. Now, yes. this bundle branch block, we are not sure whether he has acquired it just after MI or beforehand he has the RBB. Did you have any previous ECG? No, sir. Achha. Let us consider that this is a new onset right bundle branch block. Does that suggest the, which part of the uh, left, uh, uh, LAD is, is involved? Uh, this suggests that this uh, lesion in the LAD before first septal. First septal. Achha. Any other information available from this ECG? I was expecting some reciprocal changes in inferior leaves, but I do not get it. That means we may or may not get reciprocal change in inferior leaves in acute ST elevated MI anterior. We should remember. Achha. What do they? Look at the P wave. There's left atrial enlargement. Was the patient hypertensive? Uh, no, his blood pressure was uh, normal. Uh, that's a curious finding. So, what do say? Acha, we'll take the comment from Rubik sir finally. But before, as we are discussing the ECG, so whether the whether it is the pure right bundle branch block or the bifascicular block. Yeah, that was that was I was going to. Ask. So, is there any special criteria for defining the entry hemiblock in presence of the entry mine? left axis deviation, you find that the, in lead 2, the S is greater than R. So the, uh, there is left axis rotation, which is likely to be left anterior hemi block, uh, which is so, very, um, there is first septal involvement is there. Other way. Yes, I have a point. Yes, please. So this is, uh, so, so first of all, the, it is, there is a right bundle. In the presence of right bundle, the STEMI can be read. Um, and th this is right bundle, left axis, bifascicular block. I don't know the clinical story, but uh, what is, because this ST pattern is not conclusively to me like a STEMI STEMI. Is there any other differential that we need to entertain? The a typical history of chest pain, isn't it? Oh, okay, okay. All right. If this, because I will go by the story more um, and and what is that issue with the anticoagulation? I just came late. No, oh. Abhis Bhai. The patient, uh, on treatment, patient uh, received thrombolytics and there was a not responding. 
and uh, during the treatment patient develop atrial fibrillation and, oh, okay. uh, and also patient de develop heart failure clinical heart failure and his blood pressure drops down we, we need to put him on uh, inotrope support and he was receiving uh, anti failure treatment and so on that you... after giving amiodarone uh, when rate goes down it's going more down then we have to stop the amiodarone and he develop again at, at afib so we have to give again, again maintenance dose. So twice uh, in acute MI setting patient, we have to give amiodarone and he was developing recurrent AFib. And he was declining any kind of uh, intervention. So we have to give him conservatively. And uh, when question of discharge arises, acute MI with uh, atrial fibrillation, the question of anticoagulation, whether we should give it, and if we give it for how long uh, people and for how long uh, we give only anticoagulation and one of the anticoagulation. presentation with chest pain, short of breath. Am um, I Hafiz, Hafiz yeah. can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. You made a very interesting point. Why did you question the ST segment elevation issue? Can you explain that to us? You, you because, have, uh, yeah. yes, I, I, if you could make it simple for all of us. So uh, first of all, right bundle is okay to read for ST elevation. We all know and we all agree. There's not. There's no controversy on that. But the way the ST segment elevation is little shoulder down and uh, there is no reciprocal changes and uh, it, uh, it is Hafez, the differential. Hafez, it is, what, what do you mean? Uh, uh, can you tell me for a layman like me, what is shoulder down? So if you look at the ST segment morphology, um, this morphology is like uh, the, the, not the convex upward Kumis, uh, Tom's, you know, the, 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 uh, the usual ST segment elevation that we see in the uh, typical ST elevation in mind. But is, here, the degree okay. of ST, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's an important point because that also struck me that, um, that in V1, V2, V3, ST segment looked like going downwards, even though it is a... Uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that it cannot be acute, but we have to keep it in mind that down yes. sloping ST yes. elevation, we have to keep other diagnosis in mind, right, Hafiz? My rule, that. yes. My rule book is if the clinical presentation is overwhelmingly uh, MI type, then I don't pay much attention to the uh, EKG. But say that this patient came in with a stroke type presentation, okay? Like a stroke type presentation and not chest pain, then you need to do the differential that it could be an injury pattern from something else. This may be a, a COVID patient with profound hypoxia. This is STEMI then makes me worried something else going on. So, Hafiz Bhai. Ha Hello, Hafiz Bhai. Yeah. I said, for our student, yeah. if the clinical scenario we don't know, so what are the differential diagnoses you should consider other than STMI? Okay, so if, if you don't know anything, so the ST segment elevation MI in this pattern, few things, right? You need to do the ST elevation MI. It could be due to the uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, which is extremely rare. I caution you, it is extremely rare pulmonary embolism presenting like this, but it is possible. It, you may confuse with Brugada, but it doesn't look like Brugada, but someone may say, well, it may be Brugada. If the patient is asymptomatic and seeing in your office, we cannot give them a diagnosis of a STEMI. We'll have to think about something else. But Burugada may look like, but not quite. But you asked me differential. So we need to be careful about those ST elevation. Now, can it be an, a, a patient with a previous cabbage and ventricular aneurysm? Possible. Exactly. There is Q wave uh, also in the precordial leads. Uh, depending on patient's history, can be a previous cabbage aneurysm and now new ischemia giving this possible. Uh, so these are all, can Takasubu present like this? Yes, Takasubu can also present like this. So there, there, is, a, there is a differential to keep in mind. I don't know, uh, uh, Anisul, Dr. Awal, Professor Sir. Awal, do you have any uh, echo down bedside? Yeah. It and was yeah. it like fully LAD territory or was it uh, more than LAD territory? 
This looks like LA territory. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. uh, can you common go? things common. Most likely, this is anterior wall MI, yeah. and and uh, and the presentation was MI. So if it is clinical MI, EKG MI, then it is probably MI. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's the first CD. What uh, uh, Hafiz Bhai was mentioning, look at V5, V6. That ST elevation is typical of uh, acute MI. But uh, ST elevation in V1 to V4 is not typical of the acute ST elevated MI. That's what Hafiz Bhai was mentioning. Then we should be a little bit concerned and should look at the history to decide which way to go. And, uh, can you go to the second ECG after the uh, streptokinase? What does it tell you, Anis? This ECG after the streptokinase, there, there's supposed to be some degree of improvement. What improvement you are expecting and what is not there? Can we? I was expecting uh, ST goes down at least 50 percent, but uh, I can see there is no ST uh, down. It's uh, it's remain elevated throughout the all leads. Uh, it's a question for students. Inferior uh, leaves, some uh, pressure in inferior leaves. Look at this now. So, uh, streptokinase was totally ineffectual in this case. But was it right? After streptokinase, there is ST elevation in AVR. Is it true? Uh, I haven't seen anything like that. AVR? But here there, there is reciprocal change and now presenting, but money rather the STV <laughs> is progressing. Next. Now Mike. No, no. Look at the ST segment. Go to the previous EKG. Yeah, now look at the ST segment elevation in uh, V4. B5 now. That looks like the usual ST elevation. So, so they, yeah, this is more reassuring now uh, that this is behaving completely like this. And and, and it looks like the um, streptokinase probably did not work. Afizai, my question is, if a patient like this who has not undergone CAT and intervention, as the patient refused here in this case, and we have to resort to thrombolytics, which is ineffectual, the patient has developed AF and hypotension. Which anotrope will you prefer, norad or dopamine? So uh, uh, definitely uh, norepinephrine first. Uh, yeah. Dopamine I would not give. And if you look at the uh, any JM paper with post MI uh, and then even cardiogenic shock, the best I mean the rule book for pressor agent is that nothing is better, uh, and this is very difficult to do head to head comparison. But norepinephrine was the was the best one to start with. But I caution you that we need to know the best guess. What is the hemodynamics? Is this is the patient gone into cardiogenic, almost going into cardiogenic shock, or maybe already in cardiogenic shock because of the poor pump mechanical problem? What is the SVR? So on the balance, norepinephrine is the first one we usually use. But then as the dose escalates or you add more pressors, the prognosis is going to be even worse. Uh, and we need to think about what to do next in terms of support, if uh, bad luck that the patient is not getting better. I'm asking this because the tendency here is to start dopamine, but the preferred pressure resident is actually not adrenaline because there's less arrhythmogenic than dopamine. And, and think about this one. The patient has a, he did have a fib, rate is not small, uh, low, and then you give dopamine. What dopamine is going to do? What is the mechanism of action? It will cause more chronotropy, right? And then it has more inotropy, and then there is no, there, it will get things worse. Patient already has a low stroke volume. We, we actually give noradrenaline sir, for this patient. Yeah, and good. Estic addiction. Anis, last question you were asking, at discharge, are you going to prescribe an anticoagulant as, as well as dual antiplatelet? That is the question you have been asking. Yes, sir. 
response of the faculties okay uh, before that let me let me caution you very because i actually get problems with the residents and fellows because post mi lv systolic dysfunction they jump on or so called guidelines direct gdmt guidelines directed medical therapy but i tell them restrain right? because yourself because if you load them with escalating doses of beta blocker ace etc you may cause harm the benefit of these drugs are actually long term there is no trial showing that within 3 days 5 days there are going to be a significant difference no so then hemodynamics first let the patient fly first because let the blood pressure come up because patient also will feel lousy if you are bombarding with all these drugs and then blood pressure like 80 this is not in a chronic heart failure is different this is just acute all these things happening and once he in in case it gets more problem the blood pressure goes down again and go, second time precipitation of cardiogenic shock you may not be able to bail out so it is very important that find out make sure there is no mechanical issues be very careful with the uptitrating the dose and then monitor closely and then and even write down in the discharge note that ace or beta block are not started we'll consider that as an outpatient because of the issues with hypotension and then okay the question about anticoagulation okay i'll wait uh, i for the fellows the most important thing is you have to think about when the coronary arteries are filling they are feeling during diastole if you are reducing the blood pressure too much actually the coronaries are not going to fill up properly so that rather than doing some good you may be doing some harm to the patient that's what hafiz bhai is alluding to we have to be restraining in deciding when to start which medicine at what doses and we should look at the hemodynamics very closely that's the point of this discussion sir uh, regarding anticoagulation uh, some meta analysis said there is opinion difference between the european and american bodies so they said the americans bodies tends to give the anticoagulant because of the there is relative risk reduction though absolute risk reduction is low but there is a, a relative risk reduction is higher that's why they used to give it uh, but european but uh, considering all this they prefer to give anticoagulation so uh, even if we want to uh, defer during discharge possibly we may have to think of anticoagulation but anish can i uh, ask a question to you yes, not sir. question actually just query once you plan to discharge the patient that means it is this patient make up hemodynamics right yes number one number two now you are thinking to discharge the patient what about your anticoagulant strategy sorry antiplatelet strategy dual or single it was dual it was dual dual what about the stmi and non stmi what about the diagnosis but you should continue at least dual antiplatelet therapy at least one years on the top of this dapt you can consider some clinical scenario anticoagulant yes according to ac recommendation you can start triple therapy then you can follow up then you can deescalate the again antiplatelet therapy as well as anticoagulant and what is your opinion regarding this point well uh, we can start triple but we have to consider the his bleeding risk as well and comorbid condition he this patient have a bit renal impairment so there is a, and he is a frail patient so there is a risk of bleeding is there so even if we give triple therapy we will give for a short duration like one of three months then we'll con uh, uh, continue with the anticoagulation and one antiplatelet maybe clopidogrel and uh, and the, uh, one of the dual before this have you gone through for the precise depth score to continue how long you continue dapt or not actually uh, we, we we couldn't uh, make all this because patient we have to discharge prematurely because of the issues of the financial it, it is on third or fifth day because the patient with hemodynamic is stable he was not uh, in inotrop support now on third or fifth day you discharge the patient we discharge the patient on fourth day fourth day Enter MI at least five days is required to hospital discharge if hemodynamic is stable. Number one. Number two, if it is possible, you can start beta blocker and acetaminophen in hospital setting. If 
blood pressure permit more than 100, then you should institute as soon as possible as in uterine beta blocker. I think uh, any other added comment, I should be appreciated from Adhusar or Havis Bhai. Let me jump in. First of all, uh, uh, I tell you what we are doing here. For the anterior STEMI, who we do PCI or inferior, doesn't matter, any STEMI uncomplicated, we are actually discharging them around 24, 36 hours. So there is no, we, we, we are pretty comfortable with that. In the COVID time, I have discharged patient post STEMI, even at like 23, 20, uh, 22 hours, like next day in the evening because of the bed issues, because it is uncomplicated um, and no uh, cardiogenic shock and no arrhythmias. Now, and no heart failure. Uh, but in this case, there was issue. This is a very unique case because there was no devascularization possible because of the patient doesn't know. And then whatever we say, it is all data from like extrapolated, uh, sort of uh, extrapolated data or sort of guess from this data. If you look at the Pioneer AF trial, the two drug policy was okay post PCI, right? But this is unique that there is a MI, troponin positive, ST elevation, and then dual antiplatelet is needed at mandatory for one year. Now, adding one anticoagulation because of the brief episode of AFib. And I would ask Rafik Bhai to comment because this AFib also, the area under the curve, the time in AFib, also it is going to be a factor. If it is a one transient post uh, and then should we really uh, press the patient for continuation of dual, triple therapy for a year? I think that will be too much of a bleeding risk. So uh, probably a, a new generation antiplatelet and anticoagulation, be careful with the renal failure, and then all like a statin and others probably will be my choice. But there is no study of failed lytics and then with LV dysfunction recovered from cardiogenic shock, this patient is unique. So we'll have to use our collective experience from the, all the trials we know. So my recommended personal opinion will be to choose like uh, Ticagrel or, or, or Prasugrel, um, but, or, or even Clopidogrel for that matter, and then use a newer uh, anticoagulant and then give like at least uh, uh, six months or a year if there is no bleeding issue. Probably for a year if Thank patient you, can tolerate. Thank you, sir. And then uh, all the others. Uh, sir, no. Rufik Amit, sir. Rufik Amit, sir. This is a scenario of acute coronary syndrome with yeah. first time atrial fibrillation. Patient was on sinus rhythm on discharge. He has got LV dysfunction. What should be our uh, anticoagulant? By this the way, before Rufik Bhai says, I sometimes do a telemonitoring um, at, at like uh, six weeks or three months. And then if patient is remaining asymptomatic and the monitoring is okay, then I try to come out of the anticoagulation earlier. And in that case, I put the patient back on anti dual antiplatelet. How, how old is the patient? Sir. How old is the Dr. patient? Anis, how was the uh, patient is uh, I'm telling. 70 years, sir. 70. Okay. So the question is anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation. So first of all, I'll give you another scenario. A patient gets admitted with severe pneumonia and develops atrial fibrillation during hospitalization. And pneumonia resolves, atrial fibrillation goes away. That's the transient reversible cause of atrial fibrillation. Uh, so it happened for the baseline reason. Same in this patient. This patient was in cardiogenic shock, was on pressors, and developed atrial fibrillation. That should not be an indication for anticoagulation um, in this patient. I'm not going to agree with it. Even in this country, uh, I'll not do that. Um, unless I can prove. And, and second issue would be that, am I going to, what Hafiz mentioned, am I going to do a monitoring for this patient for atrial fibrillation. I don't sure. I'm not sure that I will do that either because then I have to monitor everybody in the community also uh, to see if somebody is getting AFib. So this patient I would not consider for anticoagulation at all. It was a transient AFib from a, a very 
um, uh, reversible reason. A reversible means there is a reason for patient going into atrial fibrillation. And then it resolves. I will not even use antiarrhythmic for this patient at all. Sir, I'm a, uh, 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 comment, sir. But before discharge, I would have another look through the echo and find out if there is LV dysfunction is severe and there is any spontaneous echo contrast in the LV. Only in that case, I will give uh, anticoagulation for a short period. But for the arrhythmia, yes, I agree with the fixer. I would not give anticoagulant. Yeah, Thank what you. is so, what is mentioning? It's a totally different reason. Yes, uh, different reason. Outside of atrial fibrillation. Thank sir. you. Yes. Oh. yes sir. So what would you not give anti arrhythmic or you would not give anti coagulant? A hey, next patient. Oh, Badu sir. Huh? Yes. Uh, I'm Dr. saying ha that. Officer so was saying, asking whether you are going to give anti arrhythmic or anti coagulant or not. Oh, I, no, anti arrhythmic. We are not actually the beta blocker is okay and the patient is sinus rhythm. I think we are not disagreeing with that. We yes. all are in same boat on that. But the anticoagulation, at least for short term, because of this, you know, if you look at the trials from Michael Izakovich, those patients who had atrial fibrillation post MI, their stroke risk was high, uh, even and paroxysmal. We don't know whether he will be doing, and the patient has LV dysfunction and anterior wall. So I would be a little cautious, not because this will be a little issue that not to give anticoagulation. Um, okay. I think I most of us will agree for giving anticoagulation and revisit. Okay. Yes, okay. time okay. in the uh, is short, and then only thing that we cannot prove as an outpatient paroxysmal, then I think we take the first opportunity to take it out and then give dual antiplatelet. But I, I, I politely disagreeing with Dr. Rafik by here. Okay, but Hafiz, so my question is that true, that there is high risk of stroke, but is there any data that anticoagulation in this group is beneficial, number one. Number two, why will you start them for a short period? For what purpose? How do, I, do, you, know he's not, now how do you know he is not going to get a TLP after six, eight weeks, after three months? So because that they, is my, that is my problem you know, is not starting. Yeah. If we start it, my feeling is in actual fibrillation is that if you decide to go for anticoagulation, this patient is 70 year old, his child's vascular with LV dysfunction will be two or three. So he's in that category. So if you decide to anticoagulate, that should be a decision for lifelong, not for short time. I mean, is there any data on that? that I have to go by uh, trial data that people have done on in this kind of cases to defend my statement i can tell you that the chad basque to start with is high so yes. indication is most brief for the initiation to taking off i would look at the all the ep issues that you know they are now saying time in atrial fibrillation there is a correlation. So if somebody uh, does not go into further re remodeling of the LV, no overt heart failure, and no paroxysmal AFib, then it is reasonable to think that uh, this, this patient probably will be okay. Uh, as I said at the beginning of my statement, this patient is unique in many ways, and it is very difficult to extrapolate data from the previous studies into this particular unique situation. No, but, yeah. the, but Hafez, we have to, the message has to be uniform for us and that should be based on science. Yeah. That's because, what I'm trying to find out. For indication at this point, yes, there is all because patient had a FIP, there is no, no uh, disagreement that we can ignore an FIP following a mind. That's, and that's that what I'm trying to. Yeah, the, at this point, if you look at this index case, there is indication to initiate. No, I'm not saying that. In an educational setting, if my student is sitting in front of me yeah. for postgraduate FCPS exam or American Board of Internal Medicine exam, cardiology, yeah. Yeah. what will be the wrong answer? If the choice in American Board of Cardiology is give anticoagulation for this patient lifelong, no anticoagulation, just antiplatelet therapy, Anticoagulation for three weeks, 
which will be the correct answer for American Board of Internal Medicine? So first of all, the board will not give you the controversial part. The controversial part is the duration. The initiation part is not the, uh, uh, is not the issue. Will American the, Board accept that? No, yes, because they will, they will give the fair balance. Initiation, the anticoagulation is indicated or not. But duration, they will, they will not give any controversy. I think we need to relook into this issue of anticoagulation and actual because that's, I would, that's I would, uh, I would say what are the other uh, faculty members think? No, no, no. I, I cannot. We cannot do that because we have to go by guidelines that is currently accepted. I think we need to talk about it. Otherwise, our no, young no, doctor. Uh, guidelines already mentioned by uh, you heard. Uh, Azam mentioned this. Uh, they, that a fib post mi and the hmm. chat mask high. There is indication. The and, only and that's only if the contraindication is there. Okay. Okay. Then, 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 Hemodynamics allow Kurbe as soon as possible beta blocker among S new to start Kurta among statin the way charter drug mandatory. Other scenario, I can anisicist a scenario the anticovalent J, Amadir J confusion the race Kurche, Eta would at the race Kora Amra discussion Kurse for academic purpose. That's okay. Among us, I'm on a case study to am I sitting a visa, Amra to the anti ischemic treatment the attack of follow up Kori. Then we can consider for integral triple therapy. Dual therapy is not a good thing. The message is that we have 70 years of age. America has 75 senior citizens. We have a trial, a senior trial, a jest trial, a trial, a DAP to start. We have a short duration. We have at least precise depth is good. It is better to take a decision that we have to do. In March, I'm going to do a little bit of the one like a must do one. I can at least standard recommendation. So I must take a bunch of the table best. Can do a market decision making processes from a job. So my dishes are a gay. What did the fellow care? This is great. Post graduate fellow of the survey. Can I know undergraduate fellow or post graduate fellow? The obviously agent is looking to practice with that. Tyler, there are daily practice at a time. Thank you, Anis. Please. Thank you, sir. Okay. My next case, 45 years main. He is non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, only respected as a smoker. Presented with chest pain and diagnosed as anterior septal amine. Actually, he presented late and uh, he was treated conservatively. And he was later, uh, angiogram shows critical allergy lesion and successful PTCA done to allergy. And we were able to discharge the patient uh, symptom free. Two days after discharge, patient came with severe chest pain with a elevation in anterior leaves. And that's his EKG. As you can see, the uh, ST elevation uh, is goes all the way very high. And we, we decided to see the what happens. So relook CAG shows uh, stand, acute stand thrombosis, actually. Anis Awal. Sir. Let us discuss your ECG first, first ECG. Sir, uh, there is another ECG. I'll coming back, just. If you sir, permit me. I said, okay. Okay, uh, so we uh, balloon dilatation and, and actually put another stand proximally, and that's the after that his ECG is like that. So we are able to disturb the patient again symptom free. So we took the history, the what's happened within two days, what happened. We disturbed the patient with Tika Gaylord, and unfortunately, patient uh, got all the patient uh, drugs, but except the Tika Gaylord. So that may be a cause, but may not be also. Uh, that's, that's it. And this is the first ECG. So, Anisawal, sir, there are three strips of ECG, the upper strip. What is the rhythm? Sir. What is the rhythm of the ECG? This one. Hmm, the, the upper one, take the... This is the 12 bit ECG, right? lead one, two, three, every, 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 and therefore... And rhythm is also here, sir. First and second strip uh, was recorded at the same time. 
Mm. No, not at the same time. Consecutively. Okay. Possibly consecutively. Uh, lead one, two, three. Avia, Avia, Avia. The second one is V one, V two, V three, V four, V five, V six. Actually, uh, you know, hospital ECG is a, like a long one, so I have to take the snap and then that's that's the uh, that's why the confusion arises. But the same ECG. Same ECG. Same ECG. That means the rhythm but, is sinus rhythm. But if the lead to P shows the inverted P. There is PR prolongation in the lead two. You see? Yes, sir. Almost two hundred millisecond. Yes, sir. Just borderline. But P is inverted in lead two. Yes. Yes, sir. A V R. Sir, Rupik sir. On also. Early state, biphasic um, peak. I mean, the baseline is wandering around, so it's. I don't think we should get bogged down with the P wave in this ECG because it's the baseline is distorted. It's distorted. Mm. But if you look in in V one, in the second ECG is biphasic, so that's sinus. And then third ECG V1 is biphasic. I can see that. The first one is also it's a stress. You have to remember the first ECG is stressed out. Right. So it's a camera picture. So you, if you look in V1, it's biphasic. In other lid, there is artifact, and also it's a camera picture. So that the grids are not right. So I, I think it is sinus rhythm. Sir, is there any posterior hemi block? Sir, is there any fascicular block? The patient have right bundle bundle block pattern. Well, no. Look, uh, no, it is look at the keyword is duration. Especially if you look at the top ECG, in V1 is not there, so I can't say anything. But um, lead AVR, AVR keyword is duration is barely 100 millisecond. Right. 97, 97 millisecond mentioned. It. Yes, it's, it's about 100 millisecond. So I, I cannot comment on that. And uh, limb leads kind of distorted, so it is tough to comment on that also. So I, I'm assuming it is sinus rhythm with normal keyword duration. So is yeah. there any significance of developing RBB following PCI? The next ECG uh, Anis was showing was a with RBB. Which one? Next ECG, Anis, please. Okay, I'm showing. Okay, so <laughs> this one. Yes. Now it's dead bundle branch block. Yeah. It is, yeah. Does it carry any significance, sir? No, I mean, which was kind of, because right bundle is so narrow, um, you can interfere with the blood supply. I, I'm not sure that is, I, we need to read too much into this. Um, so the, 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 in the gastro trial, in the and then in the earlier ISS trial, the new right bundle with clinical presentation of uh, sounding like MI uh, can be important, but that has been scrapped from the current guidelines with the right bundle uh, alone to be an indication for STEMI activation. But clinical context is important. Here, uh, I would not put too much into this because the clinical presentation is like a patient had an LAD intervention, right, Anis? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, LAD. LAD. And then LAD revascularized. Patient is doing okay or patient is now recurrent patient chest? Is okay, patient is doing okay. Hello? Uh, but but the, we have now seen this and the patient is completely asymptomatic. Asymptomatic right now. Then, then there is no concern really. I, Hafiz, uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So I think just to re-emphasize for our audience what you just said. So let's make an assumption that somebody had a totally normal ECG before, have an acute MI, perfect intervention, post-intervention develops right or left bundle branch block, complete yeah. right or left. Yeah. Right. Does it change the treatment at all, future management? So if it is a complete right bundle and the patient has developed chest pain, but no, no. No, uh, the patient way. is completely asymptomatic and no, nothing is going on. It does not change. 
you know, I'm going to ask the question again. Patient presented with acute MI, anterior MI, before MI ECG was normal, acute anterior MI, you do intervention of LAD, post-intervention patient develops right bundle branch block, but is symptom free. Or develops left bundle branch block, is symptom free. Yeah, it does not change. But okay. left bundle is worrisome because the prognosis is going to be bad. But is it going to change my management, future management no, of this patient? not really. Okay, thank you. Sir, I, I just want to mention one thing because I want to clarify this issue that from the last patient. Remember that patient had an MI and then dual antiplatelet is the DAP test score is for the post stent. That patient did not get a, uh, a stent. So we'll have to invoke the earlier trials when there was no PCI done or in a case in that patient is a STEMI presentation, non STEMI presentation from the cure data that one year is in, uh, important. So sometimes in the board, they give you this tricky question saying that patient is non STEMI went to the cat lab and then patient got bare metal stent and the dual antiplatelet to continue for, you know, six weeks, three months, one year. The answer is one year because the presentation was in mind. So the DAPT score, uh, you know, if you look at the, and by the way, there is a, uh, a website, uh, Azum knows, the DAPT score calculation. You can actually go, go online and check DAPT score online and then wow. see. Once you put one year, then uh, once you put MI, then the duration becomes one year automatically. But now you're adding a fee, then you need to balance the risk benefit of the bleed, bleed versus the ischemic benefit. That's all. So what happened to this patient? Uh, the patient is clinically stable and we are able to disturb the patient's symptom free. Uh, Anis, can you go back to the angiogram? Yes. Uh, yes, this one. Uh, run. Uh, look at this. The LAT is occluded from the ostium. And whenever you are intervening, you are opening up the artery down, uh, downstream, but the first septal is receiving a lot of thrombus. I think because of that, the patient developed this right bundle branch block because the right bundle branch is supplied by the first septal and is injured. That's why. Thank you, sir. <laughs> not have done. Thank you, and Dr. To, Anis. And to, uh, and to know that, uh, Wadud, you know that the new right bundle complete and the fluorid presentation of MI, the culprit artery is the LAD because and proxy LAD. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anis, for showing two very good cases. We have got a number of other cases. We'll listen to you on the next session. Now we want to move to our um, session with Dr. Rufik Ahmed, sir. Professor, I think Hafiz, you have ECG. Hafiz, sir, you have got some presentation? Uh, yeah, let me. Uh... Okay. Thank Dr. you, Dr. Anis. Thank you. Welcome, sir. By the time Hafiz, sir, ready, I like to say one story. In the 2019, we went to Hafiz, sir, hospital. Actually, he picked up from the uh, our hotel, came with his luxury car, Tesla. And we are just amazed by his, the, the car is opening and he drive all the way and we joined his morning session. That was very rich and we really enjoyed. And while, while we were visiting his hospital, one of the senior nurse said, uh, you are from Bangladesh? We said, well, our best uh, doctor and best cardiologist from your country. So yes. that make us very proud. <laughs> nice, nice story, nice story. Among half his way, a Tesla Kinner Portuguese Tesla company, I found first billionaire is there. Huh? Number one. <laughs> he is the brand ambassador of Tesla. <laughs> so um, I paid that nurse a lot. But anyway, um, so can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, we can see. So, so um, I actually uh, will show, I talked to Rafik Bhai earlier. I will show two, two uh, cases from the board review course because the fellows are presenting and I thought just, I present two from that and then a couple of patients from our, our own. So this is one from the board. So I wanted to show you that uh, what was the scoring there and, uh, and how 
our audience do. And I'm pretty confident that our audience will do right. 45 year old um, saw is a consultation in the office and pounding heartbeat. And then uh, during, which increases during stress. Um, echocardiogram was normal. One of the things that I learned that the way the board review questions are set, every line, they also teach you that PVCs and that getting worse on stress is actually a very worrisome. Echocardiogram was normal, a stress test uh, had to be stopped due to increasing ventricular ectopy and a five beat run of ventricular tachycardia that terminated as soon as exercise was stopped. And this is the uh, EKG at, the, at that time. So the questions are, which of the following explains the origin of the PVC? RVOT, LV free wall, RV free wall, LV apical region, not PVCs, aberrancy with left bundle morphology. Yes, we can invite Abdul Al Jamil after this poll. Actually, it's good. E, we can ignore. E is rubbish. Uh, so D, uh, A, B, C, D. Yeah, let's see. And then Rafik Bai can make the comment. Interesting. What happened to the poll? The poll result. Okay. So, Thirty percent. Can you show the poll result? Sir, one second. One minute, sir. Okay. Wow. That how that changed. Earlier, A was. Um, 30%, now he has dropped. Well, no, because it is the number. Only one person said RVOTVT, six person said, six person said um, LV free wall, RV free wall, and then apical region. Um, anybody wants to make a comment from the faculty or you want me to drop? Yeah, Jamil. Sir, <coughs> Jamil, you can comment. Uh, me. It should have been easier if there is. Uh, it's from right side. And. So when it comes to EKG, there is an EP way of explaining and there is an interventional way of explaining. <laughs> Rubik, <laughs> way, the EP way of explaining. Let me but, tell you the EP way of explaining. But Does question, it look like left bundle or right bundle? Your left question bundle. is left, left, left bundle. Left bundle. If it is left bundle, it is coming from the yeah. right ventricle. Right, right, right ventricle. Right. If it is right ventricle, question is where? Is it coming from the inferior, inferior positive? So if it is inferior positive, then outflow tract is the source because from yes, the yes, yes. outflow tract it is pushing the voltage up. So it yes. is RVOT origin. Yes. Um, Rovik Bhai, that's what I can say. No, no, then you, you can take it from the, for the LV. There is another way to do uh, free wall versus septal, um, and then yes. and then LVFX. So, so I'm going to pay due respect to all the answers <laughs> because. I'm going to start with number D, LV apical region. So whoever answered LV apical region, if this was coming from the left side, it will be right bundle morphology, which it is not. 
Second, if it was coming from the apex of the heart, lead V6 is at the apex and it will move away from V6, so V6 will be negative. So that's not correct. This is left bundle morphology and V6 is positive. Then I'm going to go to RV free wall. So true, this is left bundle type. So it is from the right side. Is it the free wall? If it is RV free wall, the impulse will be moving from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. And V6 will be positive, which it is. But AVL will also be positive, which it is not. You see, the AVL is negative. Next, I'm going to come to LV free wall. Again, number B is said LV free wall. Majority of the people said B. If it was LV, it would be right bundle morphology. If it was free wall, again, yes, AVL is negative. That can support it. But look at lead one, lead V6, V5. They are positive, so it cannot be free wall. The other, other thing, most important, if I have a young person with palpitation exercise induced VT, without thinking, first diagnosis is RV outflow tract ventricular tachycardia, because that's the most common. And in Bangladesh, of course, we have fascicular VT a little bit there. So this one, a left bundle morphology um, with positive in two, three AVF, it is right ventricle outflow tract ventricular tachycardia. And but this is a very and the subsequent <laughs> excellent uh, Rovik Bhai, uh, but the audience, you notice that the trick Rovik Bhai uses is that the what is the answer? Free wall. Look at the opposite of the LV free wall, opposite lead of the LV free wall, and what the voltage happening in that. That will give you the clue. Because I look at very plain way, but Rovik Bhai explained very nicely. The next question they usually ask. This patient has history of syncope, and the answer will be patient gets an ICD, ablation, pharmacol pharmacological treatment. What, what will be the answer? Anyone or can jump in? You didn't give the choices. Oh, OK. okay. Sorry. Uh, no, I, I, I did not put it in the question because it was not in the question. I said that okay. patient has recurrent syncope, uh -huh. this patient, and then patient gets an ICD, patient goes for ablation, patient go, started on anti uh, arrhythmic medications, and number four, do further workup. Okay. Uh, show us the poll. Yes, sir, starting. So A is ICD, B is catheter ablation, C is entry admic drugs, D further evaluation. Half is this taking away my business. He <laughs> <laughs> should stay with intervention, half is. <laughs> no, no, I'm actually I'm actually giving the general cardiology perspective of the EP. And you are making it excellently easy. Okay. Now, the question is, Habib Bhai. Yeah. Whether further evaluation you will do or you will refer the patient to EP? No, okay. no. So that is the result, sir. Okay. What is the answer? Can you give me the A was ICD? Yeah. A was ICD. B was catheter ablation. C was? Antiarrhythmic drug. Uh, D? Further evaluation. Further evaluation. Okay. Yeah. So I think the, uh, shall I answer this? Yes, yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So the question is, this patient has syncope and exercise induced ventricular tachycardia, young person, normal LV function. One of the things we have to remember that why do we give defibrillator? To reduce risk of sudden death. If somebody has normal left ventricular function, and a negative stress test or normal coronaries, the chance of sudden death from the ventricular tachycardia is very low. So before putting ICD in a young person, we have to think many, many times. That doesn't mean that we don't put it in with, with those criteria. 
I have to then look at, is this patient, does this patient have any other substrate? Just because normal left ventricular function, uh, ventricular function normal doesn't mean that there is nothing else going on. And what else can go on? One will be arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And one of the key will be, if you look in this ECG, V1 is, T is negative, but V2, V3 is positive. A lot of times we'll see inverted T wave in RV dysplasia. So I will do a cardiac MRI on this patient to make sure there is no infiltrative disease or arrhythmogenic dysplasia. And if those are absent, I, I may, I, I can pursue two choices. One is this patient, I have never documented that the patient has ventricular tachycardia. One, I will, can do an electrophysiology study to see if we have any fast ventricular tachycardia documented and we'll do ablation and then follow the patient long term. Um, we also have to remember that patient can have two different causes of syncope. Somebody can have ventricular arrhythmia and at the same time can have vesovagal syncope. And if you look at these PVCs, they are not very fast. So I think further investigation with ablation probably will be a reasonable choice in this patient, unless Hafiz has any other comment on this. Hafiz? Hafiz, sir, please. Hafiz, sir, please unmute yours. Sorry, B, B and D, Rafiq, by the ICD should not be entertained in that case. That's the, that's the message they wanted to give. Um, that it is very important. And then a patient with syncope and this kind of issues, you cannot rely on the anti-pharmacological treatment. So you need to get further evaluation or protect immediately with the ICD and then evaluate. But both are acceptable answers. So I just wanted to ask you this because we talked about uh, uh, pharmacological management. 46 year with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy severe AI and got a aortic valve replacement and then still on the ventilator, blood pressure 80 and the patient developed this rhythm. And what to do next? Do you have Paul? I mean, we have to give a choice. First of all, we need to give choice of diagnosis. What is the diagnosis first, right? Well, I, I just, uh, I just uh, bundled it up. So you have to give us four choices for the physicians to answer. Yeah, so first, I think A, B, D. Uh, we can delete okay, D. So we'll, delete e. so will I start the poll now? Yes, you can start. So we have got four uh, A, B, C, D, but the questions are A, B, C, D, E. E is out. E is e out. Is out. Yes. Okay. Please choose the, choose the first four. Very few of them uh, answered the question, only four, four, eight, eight persons given the answer. Hafiz, you discuss. Yeah, little trouble, Rafiq Bhai. Can you, can you take this? Little trouble. <laughs> well, I mean, the first question is, what is the rhythm? What is the if you look, ECG? If you look at the ECG, can we go back, Hafiz, to the ECG? Yeah. Can we take the pole out? Uh, no, I... keep the pole. No, but then I cannot move. Oh, you cannot move? Okay. Take the pole out, please, and then Hafiz can move, and then bring the pole back, please. Remove pole tech, no. Manasar, I don't relaunch for it. No, no, no. Hafiz, sir, I don't want to cross the pole. I don't want to cross the pole.
Yeah, A eight. Go back, Hafiz, please, to the first ECG, the one that you showed us. Oh, uh, yeah. This is the first. This is the only EKG. No, no, no. You are, now you're showing intracardia. No, no, no. This is it's the... coming, sir. It's coming, sir. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this ECG, if you look at it, the rate is, this is irregular. So, and it is left bundle type. And if you look at lead V1, V2, V3, the initial R is very narrow. So it looks like atrial fibrillation with left bundle bank block. And so the, the issue is if this patient, this is not ventricular tachycardia, right? this is atrial fibrillation. If the hemodynamically patient is stable, there is no need to urgently cardio for this patient. So the um, wait and watch is probably a reasonable choice for this. Um, I don't know how many days post um, valve replacement um, this was. A lot of times, this, this, some of these patients will convert spontaneously. And then, of course, if they don't convert before discharge, probably will convert the patient to normal rhythm. Sir, in B6, sinus rhythm? No, no, that's part of that. It, 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 this is the funny part. Because yes. if you look at the V6, Oh, I don't know where the lead was. The, the initial wave, which looks like the P wave, matches with the R wave in V5. I think this was position of the electrode. So this yes. is, this is an interesting ECG. <laughs> I looked at that. I looked at it initially. I thought it, but please remember it happens because it, 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 it depending on the position of the that lead. That is exactly the reason I put acceptable hemodynamics. Wait and watch. Uh, so. So uh, I don't think that D is an option. So uh, yes, I, I would take give amiodarone or A, post-op AFE, blood pressure 80, proceed with cardioversion. But I tell you the logistics. This patient is conscious, right? You'll have to ask for anesthesia or somebody to give propofol and, and do this. So therefore, while you are doing this, you can give amiodarone and then, and then organize and then be ready that you may need cardioversion. Uh, DIG is an option, but it takes six months to work. Uh, so, Ravik, but I don't want to show this maybe next time because that will take a little longer time. Uh, what, but I will show you this one, uh, and then I will give it to you. Uh, this sure. is my last one. And the, so this patient, uh, chest pain, and in the ambulance, went into Hafez, this room. Hafez, Hafez, can you wait? You showed another intracardiac ECG, which was, what was that from? That is also from the board. No, is it the, that patient before or no? No, no, no. This oh, is okay, okay, all right. But that will take longer time. I'll give it to sure. you another time because you need to spend a little more time. We don't have that time. Sure. I'll sure. send you the ECG first so that you can explain to the audience. Um, so this patient is interesting. Um, chest pain and in the ambulance had this and then uh, resuscitated, intubated. No, yeah. We can't see your screen. You, we are, okay. Now, now can, we can see. Okay. There is a time lag, looks like. Yes. Uh, and now it's visible, sir. Okay. Now, so intubated, uh, now moving all four limbs and no respond to vocal commands, and return of spontaneous circulation, ROSC, and then EKG chest X-ray done, and labs done. And this is the EKG. Uh, I, I, will, I didn't get the story because this ECG was when? So this is a patient with chest pain was getting, uh, was EMS was bringing to the hospital. On the way yeah, to the hospital, patient developed this rhythm. Oh, okay. Them, oh, okay. And they sure. resuscitated. And after the resuscitation, they, no, no, in the process, they also got, he also got intubated. And on arrival, he was moving all four limbs, but no response to vocal commands. 
and return of spontaneous circulation, not on pressors, and EKG chest X-ray done, chest X-ray okay, labs pending, and this is the EKG. I don't know whether you can see the EKG now. No, there is, I think your storyline and our ECG that we are seeing, there is a gap. Because no, there is a you can't see my EKG. What's next? The one that I see is the VF. Oh, it's coming, sir. I, I can see it, sir. It's okay, now. Yeah, maybe Baltimore is further than Bangladesh. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, now we can see it. So the question is what we do now with this patient? Sir, we are keeping the poll for 30 seconds. Should we go for more time? Yeah, you, can, you can give the attendees some time to see the ICD. Okay, sir. I'll remove go for the poll now. Give them 10 or 15 seconds time, then start the poll. I, I'll give extra time then. Okay. will be interesting. Okay, I think 30 seconds is over. Afil, you discuss this, please. Okay, so I don't see the poll. Do we need to? 20% uh, says it A. Okay, okay. 47% so, says B and 33% says C. Any comment from the faculty? So no one is giving critique. Actually, very good. I like that. But Wadud, will you consider if there is a area that there is no available I mean, uh, revascularization, will you give lytics in this situation? Uh, probably what the sir is not with okay. us. So it is very difficult to, to justify lytics in a situation like this, with just postcode and uh -huh. neurological uncertain. Professor Oren Maski, can you make some comment? Oh, Oren yeah, Maske. Dr. Maske. Yeah, I can see some uh, generalized STT changes mm -hmm. in inferior mm -hmm. and anterior leads and if the patient has uh, chest pain and everything I would I consider if you can exclude pericarditis then Hello? another mm -hmm. option would be doing a cath because yeah, inferior leads and anterior leads STR changes I would go with cath and revasculations. Yeah so the post um, cardiac arrest, which is documented VP when post-resuscitation ST elevation MI. This is primary VF, right? And in those situations, the neuro outcome, if it is, uh, we need to follow the Glasgow Coma score and the indication. Here, the patient is responding to, you know, stimuli. So I would not jump for therapeutic hypothermia, but we need to have an idea that sometimes patient is Glasgow Coma score three, should we go for uh, revascularization? Actually, this is, uh, we should be proud that one of our physician um, from Delaware, uh, uh, Rovik Bai knows, he also published this paper. Uh, Rovik Bai, Delaware, Amanda Diye Bai, or Namki? Esan Bai. Esan Bai was actually one of the authors that you don't need to wait for the neuro outcome. You need to proceed for revascularization if it is a STEMI situation. Now there are more data that you need to figure out there is whether there is any coexistent issues like profound hypoxia, pH low, other comorbidities, 
prognosis poor, then uh, pH is less than 6.9, and cardiogenic shock, then you think about how you allocate your resources. But in this case, patient return to spontaneous circulation, not on any uh, pressors, and then neurologically reasonably good, then cap and revascularization is the ideal. The uh, therapeutic hypothermia will be an issue, but usually we don't do that if the patient is getting already uh, better and you have four to six hours window. So B will be the most appropriate answer. C, I would say that probably not a good choice because if you wait uh, in this situation and then do later and wait for the neuro recovery, the outcome may not be the best, but it all depends on the local resources. I probably will not go for administering lytics in this situation. Um, and then the question is, after the recovery, patients uh, got better, the uh, extubated, EF now 25 to 30%. Before the patient goes home, guidelines directed medical therapy was started. Question is, should we give the ICD now or should we not give the ICD? Before that, can I ask a question to yeah. a Bangladesh guy? I mean, of course, CAT is available everywhere in USA, but in Bangladesh, it's not. So if somebody is in Nauga, and I know patient had neurologic deficit, most likely from the VF and acute ST elevation MI, what are you going to do? Let this patient sit without any chance of revascularization? That means, should we consider lytics at all or not? In the so, context of bank, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Anyone to address that? Uh, can I can I just uh, okay, Anis, Dr. Anis. Uh, ECG shows here uh, inferior among uh, and the and the lateral, most likely lesion in the LCX, and this patient is the uh, survivor of the cardiac arrest. So we should go for any kind of revascularization. Whether if we do not have the access to CAT, we can go for lytics. Only concern is that whether this there is any already neurological deficit. If there is no neurological deficit, if I found that clinically plantar is not extensor and patient can move around and patient can respond, I can go for lytics. Yes, so I think we need to remember that because it's uh, um, in Bangladesh, uh, I'm sure in Nepal, not it's not so easy uh, to get the patient to the target location so quickly. So lytics should be kept in so, so mind. So let me, let me tell you that in the, like uh, in the US and the recommendation, if you have a remote area and then this situation, you know, the post, they probably will will have the same problem that you have. But most of these patients actually higher, even higher chances of bleed. So in, it is better to communicate with, uh, with the uh, PCI centers and then see. In a desperate situation, when we think about the lytics, it is immediately we need to talk to the family because the outcome may not be the best and patient already intubated and neuro poor and then the family, unless we tell them and let them know they, they may be very disappointed. So I, I would caution you that it should be a shared decision making at that situation. Sure, thank you. Uh, by the way, this was a media lady, it was a wraparound. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Hafiz, sir. And now we'll the way, move- Rubin, to... about the ICD. That, that is the reason actually I brought this up because this is a very important issue. I think you, uh, should we wait for 35 days? Or like six six post MI so, post MI post intervention EF twenty percent and we have at the setting of acute myocardial infarction what we will do we will send this patient home on a life vest with appropriate guideline directed medical therapy for uh, coronary disease and ischemic cardiomyopathy and after ninety days we will recheck his ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction is less than 35%, then patient gets a defibrillator. If it is more than 35%, then the question would be whether we need to do an EP study or not. But this was really mm -hmm. in the setting of an acute MI, and one can always mm -hmm. opt not to do electrophysiology study. If the EF is like 35 to 45, one may choose to do an EP study to see if there is any inducible VT or not. Um, otherwise, no, not, no immediate defibrillator. So, so this is very important in the dynamite trial, they showed that 
you know, if you give this early on in the same, there was no uh, benefit. And actually, uh, another scenario that this patient, if about 48 hours later, then got some chest pain, and the the Ray fellows are doing the troponin. Troponin was still high, and the patient was taken to the cat lab. Uh, but be, why? Because patient developed another episode of BFib. Uh, it, it's about 36 hours later. And now we see that the uh, stent and the LAD is patent. What do you do now? <laughs> you have to make life difficult, huh? <laughs> because uh, I mean, our EP guy says, oh, this is a stent probably closed, but the stent luckily was good. It is so started, what, I don't have that strip. It was very interesting. It was like a um, VT and then degenerated into a VF the shot. But I mean, ideally post MIVT, we wait 72 hours, but this one's post intervention. And if somebody develops VT, VF we can ignore. VT, there is a scar. So this would be a tough case not to give a defibrillator. Um, because it have the stent is open. Um, was there any uh, increase in the troponin? No. 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 So the, there is no spike. The, yeah. So I, I, that in that case it will be tough not to give a defibrillator. To so this that patient. will be like a secondary VF, not primary. Secondary VF. Exactly. Now it is VT degenerating into VF. That's the secondary prevention now. Yeah. So so this is very important that. Sometimes we see this, and when that happens, in the post MI, post stent, in the hospital, patient develops another um, runs of VTVF. First, we need to check out that the plumbing side is good, and then that point, the electrical side, we have to address. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, uh, Rafik Ahmed, sir. Yeah, give me uh, one second, I'll pull up my... So we'll make it brief. Um, I, I'm, we'll come down to the earth now from complex things. We'll do simple stuff. Uh, When Ravikbhai is loading, I have a question for the faculty, actually. Uh, when you do the EKG throughout the hospital, in your hospital, who reads the EKGs? For, you know, for, for, for the hospital. For the hospital as a whole or in the cardiology? No, as a whole. Because uh, do you let the medicine people read their EKGs or you control the EKGs? No, uh, there, there are different policies in the different hospital, but most of the time it is the department they take the. Oh, I see. Because I tell you what we do in our hospital, the medicine can read the EKGs, but all EKGs come to our department and we finalize the EKG. Basically, I need to know the hospital, um, what we are doing in terms of EKGs and that way, I actually initiate many consults myself uh, because uh, it was not uh, noted by the team. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, back to normal life. So think simple. Please answer this. Yeah, I would like more people to participate and answer as many as possible. Did you pull? I have started, sir.
All right. So I think um, answers were majority, all of them were either normal sin normally CG sinus rhythm mm -hmm. or sinus rhythm sinus rhythm normally. So I think both are acceptable answers, and I'm very happy that nobody said anything else. Um, even though I put some thing like ST elevation in V2. And there is a reason for it. If you look at lead V2, it looks like there is ST elevation. And that's a normal finding um, in, in 12 EDCG. So that's not abnormal finding. So now I have this one. So the poll ended? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's an interesting distribution. I think I would uh, I want Fidoz to make comment on this. Sir, uh, in the rhythm step, in the uh, lower part, in the delete two, uh, it is irregularly irregular. So uh, it is not sinus tachycardia. And as it is irregular, irregular, it is not atrial flutter with twist to one distribution. And uh, regarding DT and atrial fibrillation, when it is at irregularly irregular, we, we will go for atrial fibrillation first rather than ventricular tachycardia. Yeah, perfect. I mean, the whole point is that you can have irregular VT, but that's very, very unusual. And if you look at lead one, and V6 looks typical right bundle. So the diagnosis is atrial phase. So you saw the rationale. Please use this rationale. The, in the rhythm strip, it is irregularly irregular. It is unlikely to be flutter. It cannot be sinus tachycardia. Um, and then the choices are atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. Um, irregular VT is not common. Uh, so my primary diagnosis will be atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. And then you look at the QRS morphology. Uh, the pattern, there is RSR pattern, not very typical in V1, but in V2, you can see the RSR pattern. Initial R is small, and V5, V6, and V lead one, typical right bundle. So that's what it is. Thank you. Remember, this can be tricky because if this patient is in the hospital um, with shortness of breath, uh, it becomes difficult to... Uh, Okay, how about this one? Can I call you for 10 minutes? Okay, so um, nobody said sinus tachycardia, which is excellent. 
and the choice between supraventricular and tachycardia atrial. Majority said actual fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Again, as Firoz mentioned in the earlier ECG, that if what happens with actual fibrillation, as the rate gets faster, it is difficult to see the variability in RR interval. But if you follow one strip, if you look at lead two, you can see there is irregularly irregular. And that brings to atrial fibrillation. SVT will be out because of the irregularity. Actual flutter is not completely out in case of irregularity. You can have, but it is rare that you will see variable conduction. So the diagnosis is actual fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Thank you. And then there is no other, of course, remember other things that there is no, we have to also look at the KRS duration, ST segment, T wave. Those are fairly normal in this patient. I think I have one more ECG and then uh, two more ECG, this one and another one, and then we'll go, we'll be done. So one person said sinus rhythm with left bundle bank block. It is true that if you look in lead V1, lead one, it looks like white QRS, but there is a pacing spike before the QRS complex. And there is a pacing spike before that. So it is every sequential phase rhythm. And once it is every sequential phase rhythm, we cannot make any further interpretation. And that makes number two, uh, number three out of consideration because everything will be distorted. So we cannot diagnose anterolateral inferior myocardial infarction. The other question is one person, um, how many people said? Uh, atrial, uh, two, five persons said atrial sensed ventricular paste rhythm. To say atrial sensed ventricular paste rhythm, I have to have a P wave followed by paste keywords. But here I have both atrial pacing and ventricular pacing. So it's a basically, every sequential paste rhythm, and after that, we cannot make any further interpretation. And I'm, I'm going to show another ECG, same patient, the day before. This is the ECG, and I want to answer the same patient. So this is live case, <laughs> systemic activation from the ER. Okay. So these wow. are all over, there are overlapping answers on this one, but this is a follow-up ECG. Basically this was day before. Uh, Two persons said actual paste rhythm, which is true. There is the actual pacing spike 
But if you look at it, in one of the lead, another lead, there is another pacing spike. And in some leads, there is atrial cells, ventricular pace rhythm. But what is happening, the QRS is not very wide. So there is pseudo-fusion. That means if you look at lead V1 and V2, even though there is atrial cells, ventricular pace rhythm, there is actually um, no capture because the timing was such that there was conducted QRS. But there is a fusion beat, the, the beat before the last, and then followed by a sinus beat. So this happens that this is not a malfunctioning pacemaker. This is just a normal pacemaker function. It is a question of the AV delay and conduction. I think we'll end here. Thank you. Sir, previous session, sir. OK. I know what you are trying to say. You are, talking, you are going to look at the V1, right? Right, right sir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew that. This EKG to recognize is a very important because failure to capture is like a call in the night, you know? Yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, Atar, tell me, what, what is your, your question? Sir, yes, sir. The viewer is positive, sir. This is the question, yeah. sir. Yeah. So the question is, why is V1 positive? You, usually, we put the ventricular lead in the right ventricular apex. Mm. And that should make V1 negative because it's on the right side. If we see V1 positive, we have to consider a few things. One that the lead has perforated and has gone into the left ventricle. Number two, you have crossed through patent foramen overly and has gone past the left ventricle without knowing that you have paced the left ventricle. Other possibility by without knowing you have gone through the coronary sinus into a branch into the left ventricle without knowing it has happened. Number four sometimes happens that there is this wrap around right ventricle. So when you put the lead, even though you are thinking it is right ventricle, it's actually on the inferior surface of the left ventricle. But we have to keep all this. So when we see this ECG, we will immediately do a chest X-ray to make sure that lead is on the right side. And sometimes we do echo. So I thought I... I, I thought I can fool everybody and uh, there was yes, nobody sir. would pay attention. I'm glad that you did. Eva, yes, do you have any comment, Atar? No, sir. Thank you very much, sir. This is the differential diagnosis. Actually, students are asked in the examination and they should know it, sir. Actually, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Atar, sir, should we show the no, no. ECG of the week? No, no, no. Actually, go, it was the Govindu's presentation. Govindu is not uh, present okay. today. So we can conclude the session today, actually. Okay, sir. Happy uh, way. Thank you, sir. We must thank uh, Dr. Anisul Awal for his brilliant presentation with two cases of STEMI. And we must also thank uh, Professor Hafiz, sir, and Dr. Rufi Ahmed, sir, for showing some brilliant cases. Uh, I thank every all the faculties for attending the session. Uh, may I request Professor M. Atar Ali, sir, to conclude the session. Now, before that, listen, Atahar. Sir. We have, we have to control Hafiz because he does TEE, he does nuclear, and now he's trying to get into EP business. <laughs> that we have to stop. Uh, no, Hafiz, is, Hafiz is not here. Okay. He's in the emergency room, sir. sir okay. 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 I'm going to a primary person. Oh. <laughs> And imaging is a very integral part of, of cardiology. And, and for the interventionalist, another modality we need to know is the CT angio, because uh, that will be like a very important to know. know. EP is the brain of cardiology, so I don't have any intention to go there. Ada, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sir. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, dear participant, thank you very much for attending for the long time. Thank you very much. And Dr. Anis, sir, actually, Dr. Anis is a young, academic, and brilliant 
interventional cardiologist and the teacher sir young teacher he works in the chitang medical college and he has got good collection and he knows how to teach so uh, dr anish thank you very much for your presentation but just uh, i will request you to make your ecg that is actually what rubik sir every day says that is a uh, you should scan the ecg not to uh, like take the camera photo actually Uh, otherwise, it is an excellent presentation, Dr. Anis. I think Dr. Anis has got good number of ECGs more, and we, Dr. I, I will request Dr. Anis to get ready every day so that we can uh, hear from you. And finally, Dr. Hafiz and Rupik sir, thank you very much for your excellent presentation and uh, today's session. And it is Dr. Uh, it is Ribu who deserves the thanks for every time. Yeah, thank and you, Dr. Arun Maski. Thank, thank you, you very Dr. much for being with us. So thank you, sir. Next day, Dr. Aisha Kader will present her cases. Sure. Thank you. See you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, sir. Assalamualaikum, thank you, sir. Assalamualaikum, sir. Thank you, Amit Sawal. Sir, you get ready so that you can take me at any time when there is a blank. <laughs> thank you very much for your nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Peter, Assalamualaikum. Thank you. Hey, Assalamualaikum.